Okay, well, we better introduce the man of the night. Well, I'll let I, you do I, it, you I think man. I think so. No, I think I've done enough talking. I think I've done enough talking for up to now. Anyway, I think I'll let you introduce him, and then uh, we'll go from there. I actually can't find him to unmute him, can you? Oh, uh, I'm here. Oh, he's there. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight, everybody, we have um, Mr. Kevin Eatwell to talk to us about psychosis or um, chlamydia, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. So, well, without further ado, here's Kevin. Okay, I'll um, share my screen, which hopefully will work. Okay, you should all hopefully be seeing the shared screen. Is that correct, George? Perfect for me. Okay, that's good then, as long as somebody can do. Yeah. Uh, okay, so psychosis is tonight's um, theme. And, and I suppose there's a, a bunch of stuff in here that could be quite scary. Um, but we'll go through and try and make a, a pragmatic and sensible approach to it. So... Psilocosis is highly contagious, obviously, uh, bacterial, and I guess prior to antibiotic therapy, then it, was, it would cause about 15 to 20 percent mortality in people if untreated. So this is what we call a zoonotic disease. Um, so we do have to be aware of that. With the use of antibiotics and bits and pieces and early diagnosis, your, your risk of death from psilocosis is much, much less. Um, we're aware that birds can carry this latently and shed the bacteria uh, and also stress is an important factor in sort of allowing it to come out uh, with things like poor diet, overcrowding, poor hygiene, shipping of the birds and getting a cold chill, breeding stress or, or relocation can all activate a latent illness. So we do have to be aware that there is a, a human health risk here and given the underlying causes that, that, that can lead to psychosis becoming clinically evident, then obviously it's a risk for us all, to be honest. If you're concerned about the human health side of it, then I'll put on here the sort of UK government guidance on signs of disease in people. Um, psychosis is, is, is an old disease, if that makes sense. Um, it's, it's been described in, in a wide variety of species, parrots, pigeons, birds of prey, through to waterfowl. Uh, really quite incredibly common in, in, in all avian species, really. Um, and I guess the, the reason that, that, it, that it's of so significant is that it, it is a genuine risk to human health. And certainly people have got psychosis from feral pigeons, for example. Um, that's one they, that, that's been contracted just by going for a walk in the park. But people have also contracted it from just visiting a local pet shop, for example, and walking out again. So you don't need a prolonged exposure to, to have a risk to yourself. Um, and because the birds can carry this with no signs of disease, then you've no way of knowing if you're exposing yourself to it. And some might be mildly sick, some can be severely ill. So I think the thing to be aware of when we're talking about this sort of condition is we need to be aware that this can go to people. Um, and if you're having symptoms that are consistent with psittacosis then the first thing you do is you go to your gp you mentioned you've got birds um and what you want to do is to prompt that gp into hunting for uh, chlamydia or, or avian chlamydia um in you and to treat you accordingly for that early in the stage of the process so um i guess to some extent it's not something that that the GP would have at the forefront of their mind if you went in with persistent signs. They're not going to suddenly leap to psittacosis as a differential. You've got to provide them with the appropriate clinical history of your clinical case and say, oh, by the way, I've got exposure to cytosines. And then that should set little alarm bells ringing in their head and they'll explore what for perhaps, you know, people who don't keep birds at home would be an unusual condition. So your, your transmission to you uh, from your birds basically is going to be through you inhaling the airborne particles of psittacosis. Uh, this could be from birds that sneeze or just general dust anywhere uh, from feces, from feather dust, really, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, you, you go into the shed and you come back in the house that you could quite easily have chlamydia all over you, basically. 
Um, so we do have to be aware it's a risk for people. And obviously with the demographic of people that keep budgies, then that's putting some of you in a greater risk as well. Um, and like I say, you don't need extended you know, contact here. This can be a visit to the pet shop. This could be feeding the, the local um, you know, collared doves in the park, for example. So again, I'm going to stick with people at the minute because this is, this is a, a human health issue. Um, and really what you're looking at here is getting respiratory signs, uh, incubation between one and four weeks before you start showing clinical signs of disease. And to some extent, it's classically flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, muscle aches. Um, and obviously, if you're compromised, then severe pneumonia or other health problems can come into effect from that. And again, a lot of cases are mild or moderate, um, but can be severe when you're uh, immunocompromised or elderly yourselves. And like I say, if you're, if you're having symptoms like this, then go to your GP, highlight the fact you've got birds because what you want them to be looking for psittacosis in you and treating you accordingly for that um, if your signs are sort of consistent with it. Um, so if we now think about chlamydia um, in your birds, like I say, going back to an earlier slide here, it's contagious. They can harbour this disease without shedding it. Um, they can shed this disease but not be physically ill. Um, stress is an important factor in birds developing clinical signs of psittacosis. And stress is this wide sort of term that we use, but basically, you know, anything that, that where birds are being mixed, uh, transported, um, ventilation is poor, overcrowding, stress of breeding, all of these could all activate a latent illness in the birds quite, quite happily. So what we basically, I, I guess, can conclude is that any bird at any life stage could be carrying chlamydia. It might be shedding it, it might not, and it might be sick or it might not be sick. Um, the sort of signs that we might expect to see in a bird that's going to start going signs of being ill with the psittacosis, um, they're generally a sick bird. I mean, I know that sounds a rubbish thing, but most birds are just generally sick. Um, and they're really down to looking at them being off colour, ruffling their feathers up, sitting in the corner, um, maybe becoming a little bit hypothermic, so they're going to do some shivering, maybe going off food. I suppose some of the classical signs we'd see in the birds would be ocular, eye, eye, or discharges from the nose, progressing through to respiratory distress. They can have diarrhea, and you get yellowy to dark green droppings as well. In these, um, and you can then obviously get them losing body condition and, and dying from this as well. So realistically, the, these are, in the clinical cases, they're poorly sick birds um, that, that would be fairly obvious, but of course they may be too uh, far gone to save at that stage. And these are just some examples of birds that we've got here, and I, and I think sinusitis like this, where you're getting a, a, a nasal discharge, or rhinitis if you want as well from these, this is fairly classical sort of signs that you're going to see. You're going to see a discharge coming out of the, out of the nares of the bird. Um, you get feather loss around that because they're doing lots of rubbing of their face and things as well. And this is sort of a fairly classical case that you would be seeing. And I suppose for me, the first question is, is can you feel it? And I think this, this, is, this is one of the important questions I will look at when you're looking at your birds, much as I've shown you some avert cases, the, the, the dark eye clear on the left here has quite marked amounts of respiratory discharge, fairly evident. You again look at the bird on the right hand side now, this grey, and you're thinking, well, is there really any discharge there? Um, you can see some changes. One of the classical signs that you're going to see is the matting of the feathers immediately around the sear. And if you're running your finger across this, if you're feeling moistness or dampness on that sear, even if there's not an obvious discharge or crusting of, of discharge around there. If you can feel dampness, then your bird does have a sinusitis or rhinitis. It's just not maybe got as severe as some of the cases which I'm gonna be showing you tonight. So for these, I would be looking at feeling the seer and looking very carefully at the feathers around that point for signs that you've got subtle disease starting to develop. 
Um, now with some of these, you, you might have, see if I can get my video to run. Okay. So a little bit of dyspnea in this bird. We've got a bit of tail bobbing there as well on that. And, you know, you might see birds that are struggling to breathe. Um, and that, if you're finding that, that's great. Um, but what you tend to find, if you've got a bird in, in respiratory distress, um, if you've got psittacosis, this basically progresses very, very quickly and that bird rapidly deteriorates. If you've got birds showing signs of respiratory difficulty, but it is mild, um, and I guess non-progressive, then it's probably unlikely due, due to be psittacosis. And the other thing I'm just going to jump off to the side now while we're here is if you've got these sort of birds and they're squeaking, then that would take us down a different avenue. Um, so if your bird is having some difficulty breathing but is well in itself, you probably don't have infectious disease. You might have what we call air sacculitis, which is inflamed air sacs, which we do get in response to exposure to respiratory irritants. That can be disinfectants, for example, um, air fresheners, you know, lots of variety of things could be, could be sparking that off. Uh, even sort of, you know, the freshness in your car, for example, can, can, can cause quite severe reactions in birds as well. Um, what I would encourage you if you've got birds that are showing signs of respiratory signs and it's uh, maybe with voice changes in particular with a bird that's making little squeaking noises, slightly higher pitch than you would expect. Um, then for those, I would, all, I would be going in for iodine um, as part of that sort of treatment regimen for a bird that, that's showing signs of respiratory discomfort. Um, this is just one of the papers looking at um, thyroid disease in budgerigars. And again, this isn't a, a new disease, um, but this was quite an interesting, uh, fairly recent paper, to be honest, uh, where they actually had about 10% of the, the bird population dying. Um, although, interestingly, with these, they got so severe they couldn't actually um, digest their food properly. The, the thyroid was compressing the esophagus, preventing the turnover of food so it couldn't go from the crop down into the into the gizzard um, they also these were just on seed fed birds and they're actually fed broccoli as well to these with no real supplementation otherwise which was quite interesting uh, as, a, as a sort of an outbreak as, as it were what um, the other sort of findings that, that, that really kind of disappointing really this is where the literature can let you down quite markedly and certainly it's something that the reviewers should have picked up on this particular paper is basically they got the diagnosis of, of iodine deficiency. Um, the breeder went, oh, right, well, I'm going to stop giving broccoli then because, you know, that's, that's uh, as we know, the, these contain goitrogens is what we call them that bind iodine and a lot of the brassicas will do that. Um, but then they put water, iodine drops in the water and then subsequently put iodine mineral blocks around for them, which were actually intended for rabbits which is quite amusing um, and the problem went away which is great um, but it's like but how much iodine did you add to the water and what was the iodine content of the mineral blocks and that sort of information is lacking in this paper which means sadly we're not in a position to say ah you know they did this they put this much iodine in the water and that resolved a clinical problem okay we, we've got a very good idea of what, how much iodine a bird needs to, to avoid iodine deficiency, but it was remiss of the authors and the peer reviewers not to, I guess what is quite an integral point of this is, how would I stop this or how would I resolve this problem? Um, I guess the downside is that this was actually in a pathology journal where they were interested in the pathology changes more than the therapeutic treatment effects, but it was a, an omission from the paper. So, Always think of iodine, and I know this is psittacosis, but we're, we're going off on a tangent, but it seemed a pertinent place to put it as we're talking about respiratory disease. And basically your standard dose of iodine that you need is two mg per kg or two mils per litre of drinking water um, as standard. Um, certainly in the short term, you can increase that. And if you are getting clinical signs due to 
um, respiratory signs due to iodine, then they do actually respond very, very quickly clinically. You know, if you're going to crop troop them some iodine straight in, normally within two or three days, the, the response to their respiratory condition is very, very marked. So it's always worth having it on the, on the list of things to do for these. Um, and like I say, if you get a good response over a couple of days, then you can pretty much say iodine was the thing. Um, and certainly there is a very sound logic in using iodine in the long term. And like I say, you're either going to consider adding it to food. The downside there is will they eat it? Um, but obviously soft is one way or drinking water is the other that I would be recommending for you to be supplementing your iodine. I would not be recommending iodine blocks. Okay, so we know if you're struggling to breathe, with psittacosis, it's going to get worse, it's going to become more severe, and you're going to die. Um, so we've got to look out for that. If you've got a bird showing signs of difficulty breathing and then you've got sneezing uh, going along, or you've got discharge at the nares, or you're feeling a damp sear, then you're pretty much doing okay, this is an infectious respiratory condition here um, that we're dealing with. This isn't budgie poo, but this is, this is actually uh, from a, an eclectus actually, but uh, uh, a different story for this bird. But the fact of the matter here is this bird had um, uh, a problem with its liver. Um, and basically when we're, we're looking at psittacosis, this, this organism itself as part of its target um, is to, to aim for the, the liver as part of that. And by damaging the liver, it basically prevents the liver from removing the bile acids from the birds, which it sort of uses for digestion. Um, and we'll come on to bile acids uh, in a little bit, actually, because they are very relevant. Um, but what happens if you get the damage to the liver and the bile acid system is impaired, these bile acids then spill over into the faeces of the bird and they change the colour into a yellowy greeny colour. So this is, is, is this spillover of bile acids either into the faeces or into the urates as we've got here. This basically is bird jaundice. This is the equivalent that you would be seeing. Uh, if, if you had a severe hepatitis you'd get jaundice. When birds get jaundice they get green poo, they get green urates. So looking at the faeces coming through and saying are these normal colour for what I would expect or do they seem a bit more bright green or iridescent than I would think to be normal then that's one of the signs that we see here that this respiratory infection it's not just a respiratory infection this is also affecting the, the liver of that bird too. So basically we, we've got to be looking at respiratory signs in the birds, conjunctivitis with a sore eye, sinusitis around the nose, um, nasal discharges, the green watery faeces or yellowy urates and we know that budgies carry this for fun or budgies have the potential to carry this organism. We know they're stressed it comes out. Um, now from a clinical perspective uh, for birds entering um, a veterinary clinic for example then there are some practices where they would be wanting to screen all birds for psittacosis before allowing them to be brought into their clinic as a patient such that they are concerned about psittacosis um, and certainly a lot of the zoological collections will also uh, be wanting to screen new birds particularly the citizens being brought into that collection uh, for psittacosis as well so this isn't just a, a, a budgie thing. So the second tangent of the night I guess what we're building up progressively as we go through um, is we've got to think about sore eyes um, they do occur in isolation, okay? You will get birds which will get a conjunctivitis and a swelling and a red eye. These are not sick birds. These can be chronic, chronic problems in that individual, but a sore eye does not make the bird have psittacosis. As an independent thing, then you can see on these pictures here, there's no discharge around the sear here. The, the sear of these birds is beautifully fine. So when you're looking at the birds with a conjunctivitis, then the irritation and discomfort due to this, which may have started off with a foreign body, like a bit of seed in there, could have been feathers snaking across the eye, a whole collection of things that could have done this. Um, 
But obviously what happens is the bird gets a sore eye, it starts rubbing, starts scratching, rubbing it on the perch uh, and making the situation worse. And you can get chronic scarring and irreversible damage to some of these eyes in that you just can never get it to clear and resolve. And some of these cases clinically where you've got such chronically diseased and damaged um, eye, eye membranes, if you like, then in some of these we actually go in and surgically remove them or cut them back because it's, the tissue is just too damaged to continue to be viable. From a practical point of view, oh, these might were these videos. I'm trying to think now. Maybe this is the videos. Okay, trim the nails down. If they're going to stick their foot into their eye, get the nails trimmed down um, such that they cannot stick a nail into it. That's the first point. Your second point is get all the feathers out of the way here. And I wouldn't pluck them because I don't like them being plucked at this site anyway trim them all back you don't want any feathers getting into this eye whatsoever you want a beautifully clear eye all the way round so your medication can get in that's the first point but the second point is you're not going to get feathers that are dragging into this eye irritating this eye and making it worse because as soon as you put drops into this eye for example or there's a discharge there the bird's going to rub that eye on the perch and it's going to spread it all over the feathers and make the situation worse. So you do want to trim those feathers back. And much as I'm not going to pass comment on shape and confirmation of the current exhibition budgie, but I think there is a potential logic in trimming a lot of the feathers around the eyes and a lot of your breeding birds before we even start in the first place. Uh, at least give them a fighting chance to be able to see where the chick is. Um, if we're looking at what to do next with these guys, then we want to get some pain relief into them. These are sore, um, that's why they're rubbing them. So one of the ones that I'd be recommending for these really is what we call Meloxicam. A lot of you will have Metacam, Loxicom, or the equivalent sort of trade names now uh, used for your dog for arthritis, for example. Uh, and these work very well for settling down inflammation in the birds as well. Uh, to be honest, anything that you think is painful in your bird, this is a good call to have in your, in your medicine shelf. Um, translating the dog solution into what do I give to a budgie to one drop twice a day uh, or into a crop tube for, for pain relief. So a, a chick that's been attacked by the parents, for example, a hen that's, that's having difficulty going through egg laying, um, you know, these sorts of type of things where I caught my leg and, and tweaked my, you know, the ring a bit and now, now I can't walk on that leg properly, all these sorts of type of things. Or I've got a bunch of quills that are sticking in funny directions and, and that's quite sore. Uh, even I think the French Malters are sore as well in that they will um, you know, be quite painful as they're losing some of their feathers too. So the Meloxicam is quite nice for pain relief for these birds and for the eyes of course quite important uh, to try and reduce their enthusiasm for rubbing their eye across the perch. Second thing on your list really, um, get some eye drops in there. Um, I don't think it actually matters what you use. Everybody will tell you their own individual special little eye drop that they use. It's so amazing and wonderful. You've got to have that and you get it from the chemist or you get it from eBay or a friend gave you a drop. <sighs> you know, it's, it's again, it's just that persistent, pointless chatter. But any eye drop will do. You get it in four times a day. I put Pred Forte on here um, because I'm... I'm We've got to be cautious of using anti-inflammatory eye drops in the birds. Um, a lot of people will use steroid anti-inflammatory drops like we've got here on the lower picture. Um, and they are effective at getting some of the swelling down. But the trouble with using topical steroids in the birds is they are systemically absorbed and you can get toxic levels quite quickly. So if you are gonna use a steroid topically in the eye or on the skin, you've got to use very small amounts and infrequent, if at all, um, for these cases. So we do have to be aware that um, topical anti-inflammatories run a risk factor for these. Um, and like I say, I probably would avoid steroid for these, these chronic conjunctivitis cases. Now, of course, if you're thinking you've got 
psittacosis present, in other words, you've got signs of a nasal discharge or there's, it, you know, it's just not one bird doing it, there's a group of birds that are doing it, then obviously if you're going to choose an eye drop to treat the eyes, it makes sense that you choose one that we know is effective against the agent that causes psittacosis as well. So now we're going to start thinking a bit about how psittacosis works. And basically there, there is two um, things that it does. You've got the elementary body. And this elementary body is basically the, the infectious element that is spread in the feces or feather dust, um, enters into the, into the host uh, cell. And then once it's done that, that elementary body becomes a reticulate body uh, and this reticulate body is a bit that replicates within the animal cells itself multiplies numbers it then reforms these elementary bodies that are then shed from the cell and then these again are infectious to other cells within that same bird or infectious to another bird or infectious to you for example and it's quite important to realize that it, it's this is an intra cellular uh, bacteria that is dividing within the host cells. The incubation that you've got uh, basically between being exposed to psittacosis uh, and the clinical signs can be as quick as three days. But again, that can extend to being three or four weeks in duration or never at all. So in terms of the birds getting infected with psittacosis, they get infected when they inhale infectious dust, uh, dried feces, uh, feather dust, feathers, uh, or to be honest, if they're eating infected fecal material or an infected dead budgie would, would lead to them getting disease that way. So it can be orally transmitted or it can be inhaled, if that makes sense. And when the, when the birds are infected and shedding it, then you get large amounts of this bug uh, excreted into the feces, okay? And these are the bits that can be spread um, when those feces dry, they can be spread into the air uh, and that spread around. And again, if the bird is sneezing, obviously that discharge itself is also infectious and that can spread to the next bird as well we don't tend to get vertical transmission here this isn't it's, it's possible but doesn't really happen from a practical point of view in that you know if your chicks are going to get this they're getting it from the hen or the cock bird sneezing on them or pooing in the box they're not getting it from the egg um and like i say if you are getting vertical transmission certainly from what we know when you're looking at uh, poultry side of things now if your eggs are infected with psittacosis they generally don't hatch anyway it, it, it just is, isn't something that goes forward through into the chick that way and like I say your young birds are infected if they're infected in the nest box it's horizontal transmission from the environment or from the parents not from the eggs and babies that can survive it at that point obviously they can become long-term shedders as well subsequently The next thing you've got then, okay, if they're, if they're all birds are going to shed it in their poo and they're going to sneeze it and everything else is how long can it survive in my shed? And the answer to that is basically about a month. So if you had uh, a bird come in, shed chlamydia, bird went away again, you'd still have infectious chlamydia from that bird a month after the bird left. And even if you had a beautifully clean surface with no, you know, seed husk or poo or anything else around and you put the straight organism onto that spotlessly clean surface it would still live for a fortnight so you do get or can get quite a large amount of environmental contamination with this bug as well that can sit there for ages and reinfect birds persistently and there's a whole bunch of papers out there looking at this because as we said, this is a, a, a significant human disease 
And depending on which country you go to, depending on the immune status of the people you're dealing with, some countries get very excited about it and others don't. This, which is a fairly recent report now, this basically is uh, a US sort of, every so often they, they produce the, this detailed document of how to control psittacosis in the US. Uh, and this is sort of a combination really between uh, medics and veterinarians looking at controlling this as a disease and obviously in the US I get quite excited about it and we're relatively lucky I guess that that this has been the US recommendations come out just a couple of years ago so it's always quite interesting to see because you're looking at this sort of I guess this sort of paper that comes out it's like how am I controlling this amongst the populations versus focusing on one or the other and of course that is very pertinent if you've got um, psittacosis in, in the the birds in the local park in the centre of New York, but then you kind of need to know how to control that in the people as well. So what they've done actually in this compendium, which I thought was quite interesting, and, and they basically looked at control measures to try and limit the rate of infection in, in people. Um, and this is a sort of list of things that, that, that were looked at. Um, they've gone through the literature completely with what supporting evidence was provided uh, from the literature to say oh you know this is this is all the people that have done this and then looking at the impact grade a impact was something that they felt collectively had a very significant impact on controlling the disease grade b was yeah well it kind of helps and grade c was well you're kind of wasting your time um so broadly speaking but if we look here the two things here that they have the, the, the highly recommended is quarantine newly affected or exposed birds and isolate ill birds. Common sense prevails there, I guess, and use disinfection measures. Common sense prevails there too. You know, we've said this will survive for up to a month in a dirty environment or two weeks on a clean surface. So that presents a significant source of infection for subsequent birds. So quarantining new birds in uh isolating sick ones and disinfecting were the major things that they had down here as controlling infection on a national sort of level um education uh was sort of there uh, you know maintaining accurate records well it's very again because all birds can carry it and shed it or not shed it and be sick or not be sick you know trying to track where this came from is is very difficult um Interesting that avoid purchasing or selling birds that had signs of psychosis was very low on the control measures, arguably because you've already got it anyway. Um, testing birds before they're boarded or sold. Again, intermediate benefit, because again, we said sometimes they're sick and shedding it. Sometimes they're sick and not. Sometimes they're not sick and shedding it. Sometimes they're not sick and not shedding it. So to test for a positive on, on shedding, it just means it was shedding it today but equally i could have tested it and it couldn't have been shedding it today and that boils down to again screening birds of frequent public contacts intermediate benefit preventative husbandry here i suppose you're here potentially looking at antibiotics and other therapy as well again intermediate in benefit um so the key message from 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 this sort of recent detailed review is quarantine isolate sick birds, disinfect everything. Now the thing is I think that, that um, we need to stop and, and just have a little think about here is there is a difference between a diagnosis and a prognosis. Um, chlamydia can be quite difficult to diagnose, it can also be quite easy to diagnose but it's a whole ginormous can of worms that we're about to open here um, for you, unfortunately. To try and make you very clear between a diagnosis and a prognosis, though, um, if, um, let's mention COVID because it's kind of topical, you know, I can go and I can get a PCR test from a swab at my nose and have a positive PCR for COVID. That is my diagnosis. <sighs> But as you know, I could get a positive diagnosis for COVID and be clinically silent, wandering around as if nothing is wrong. 
I could have a diagnosis of COVID and I could be hospitalized on a ventilator and I might not die, you know, I might die. So the difference between me having a diagnosis of COVID and my prognosis for survival is completely different. It's a question of how sick am I as a result of that infection? That's like saying, oh, I've got cancer. Lovely. Well, what is it? Is it a small lump on your hand, which I have? Or is it some other systemic, you know, uh, bone marrow sort of style thing going on? Completely different. And so it's very easy for a, a lot of uh, people to want to, uh, when it comes to dealing with themselves or, e or even with uh, animals, is what's the diagnosis? I can tell you the diagnosis. The question is, you really want me to ask is, what is my prognosis? How bad am I? How sick am I? How, what's going to happen? Not so much, what have you diagnosed? So, going back to this lovely review, then this is just going through now looking at what they considered to be confirmation that you have an infection. This is making you that diagnosis. Okay. And to confirm it, they wanted you to have at least one of the things I'm going to go through here. Um, and the first thing was, was you've actually managed to culture or isolate the organism from a clinical sample. So that's normally, you know, you cultured something from poo or something like that. Um, that's great. You need special medium to do that. It takes time, special conditions. These aren't routinely commercially available. Realistically, this is not something we're going to be doing for uh, pet birds, to be honest. It's just not generally viable. The second one was, okay, well, let's use uh, PCR testing. And okay, PCR this is now a word I suppose most people know now because of COVID. Um, but this is looking for the DNA in the tissues from pathology basically so you, you're basically having an animal die you're having post-mortem signs that's consistent with psittacosis and then you're doing a dna test on those tissue samples and say oh yes this is present within that tissue and we've got consistent disease are we going to do that with birds probably not and then the next one you've got here is looking at um using what we would call, I guess, uh, immunofluorescence testing. So on biopsy samples, if you put special stains on them, they can make it glow up if certain organisms are present. And basically, the, the, the ability for that currently means it's not diagnostic enough. It, they cross-react, it doesn't work. So this, again, doesn't confirm you've got the infection. And it's also something we probably wouldn't be doing clinically. Next one here, um, you might do cytology on a postmortem. Um, that certainly would be the case. There's special stains you can do um, on a dead bird to look for signs of chlamydia um, in smears from a spleen, for example, or a liver, uh, or maybe from an eye, for example. Then we might do that. This is something we might kind of get around to doing. can do serology as well there are antibody tests that you can do um, and what they're looking at here which is an interesting one um, also fairly pointless to some extent is they're looking at you taking a blood sample to look at antibody levels but you're going to keep hold of that for two weeks and not run the test and then two weeks later you're going to take another blood sample from the same bird and then you're going to run those two on the same assay run so that you know you're, you're confounding factors of different times of doing it on different machines is eliminated and then two weeks later you go oh maybe you did have that infection um we do use antibody tests to determine disease in birds but to be honest again it's not something going to be doing for budgies either it's not really practical um certainly bigger birds we would do but for the budgies we, we limit a bit on what blood we can get and that would limit this as a, a viable opportunity as well so basically, the, the chances of us giving you a diagnosis based on, on those, those fairly rigid criteria is non-existent. I'm not going to diagnose psittacosis in your birds because I can't. Not practically, not with, you know, common sense approach and, and looking at how much money you're going to spend and, and all the rest of it. 
We can suspect psittacosis, we can suspect chlamydia by using bog standard PCRs, and these are commercially available. You can collect up poo from your birds, you can shove it into a bag, you can send it off for a PCR and say, is there psittacosis present here? And that you certainly can do. That would give us a suspicion you have psittacosis. And by best um, is, I guess, one of the UK leaders in terms of doing the um, PCRs for this. Um, these, like I say, are available commercially. Um, and you can just send your swabs in and, and find out. Um, for the point of reference, this is where I work. That's where BioBest is four minutes away. I'm, I'm very lucky that I can basically, if I, they come into a daily pickup from us, if I've got a sample that we need to be running for any of the DNA testing, basically I can just get somebody to walk it across or pick up by truck straight into BioBest to get answered the same day. No worries with post. So it, it's very convenient <laughs> that BioBest happened to be that close to where I work. Um, so the faecal PCR, like I say, is probably the most common test that we would do. This is looking for the DNA of the organism in the same way we're looking for the DNA of COVID. Um, they don't need to be fresh. They can be stored. It's just looking for DNA in that sample. And the more samples you collect over a longer duration, the greater chance you're going to pick up that somebody's shedding it. So if I took one sample, if I'm not shedding it at this minute, it's negative. If I take two, I'm doubling my chances. Three, it's getting good, et cetera, et cetera. So the more you take, the greater chance that you've got here. The important thing though, for, for two reasons which we come on to, is if I treat my birds with certain types of antibiotics before I take this test, I might stop that bird from shedding, at which point my PCR will be negative but it will be a false negative because I've already treated the birds, if that makes sense. And the sort of drugs that we know will do this are drugs that are effective against psittacosis, but also drugs that aren't really that effective. Enrofloxacin is on this list. This is Batril. And I would think a lot of people that have Batril sitting around at home would be reaching for that for the birds with these sort of signs. And then if you've done that, you go, oh, maybe it's something going on here running a PCR test with the chlamydia on faeces is now null and void because you've ruined the best chance you had at trying to confirm if you have the infection in the first place. So even if they've had a single dose, you probably won't find it. And even if you collect a large number of faeces over a number of days, you may still not find it. It's intermittent shedding. A negative result from your birds means I haven't found it yet in your birds. A positive DNA sample on a PCR means, yeah, a bird's been shedding it. Doesn't mean to say it's sick. Doesn't mean to say it's ill. Doesn't mean to say all your birds have it, or they probably do. And bear in mind a positive PCR is a suspected case, not a confirmed case. Now, okay, if we do end up with a positive PCR on testing, we know this is a risk to human health. And if that's the case, then yeah, I'd be treating. Because I want to treat because it's a risk to you and any bird that turns up positive, then it warrants treatment. The good thing we have here, also the bad thing as I've just mentioned, is if I treat a bird with an antibiotic that is even if it's not completely effective against psittacosis, if I choose the right one, generally within sort of 48 hours, I will stop that bird shedding. In other words, you're infected, the bird's infectious, it's sick, it's shedding. As it's shedding, it's a risk to your human health. It's a risk to other birds because it's shedding. If I give it an antibiotic that is variably effective, what that might do is stop the bird shedding. The bird's still diseased, it's still sick, but if it's not shedding it anymore, it's no longer infectious to other birds, it's no longer infectious to you. And depending on your health status, depending on your vet, depending on your GP, some of these will come back and say, 
euthanize all the birds and move on. Just kill them all. It used to be notifiable in the UK. It's no longer notifiable anymore. Um, but certainly going back a couple of decades, it was, and people got very, very excited about this as a condition. And to some extent, people are still very excited about this as a condition. Um, and so depending on where you go, you might have a recommendation of euthanize all your birds if you end up with a positive PCR. Um, you can get fluorescent antibody testing on, done on faeces as well, which we also used to use. I've got some pictures in a minute, but we don't really use this much anymore now. Um, and again, it's still a suspect case. Speed clam was one that a lot of people used to use. It, it's again, it, it's uh, used to dunk some bird poo in this, mix it on with the reagents, run it across the, the rapid test. And if you got two lines, you'd be like, oh my God, um, this bird is shedding chlamydia. And okay, it would be an instant test result. So I would, perhaps would change the way in which I would treat that nurse as a clinic, uh, treat, nurse that patient as a, you know, as a clinical case in the clinic. And the antibody testing we could also do as well. And this is one of the ones we used to use, use as well, the immunocone, uh, which we used to use to get antibodies in birds, uh, which we used to do for testing in the birds in house as well. So if you want to do antibody testing, you need to get blood. For the budgies, you're going to anesthetize them. You're going to use your jugular. Um, it's the only real chance you've got on a bird. This is your, your jugular there. Um, 27 gauge needles, this is an insulin style needle that you would be using to draw your blood. Teeny tiny blood tube. Uh, and then, like I say, you can do your antibody testing on your birds. But again, not practical in, in the sense for, for, for budgies at home. And antibodies, this is the trouble with antibodies. Uh, and again, you have a COVID reference as well, if you like. You know, a, a positive antibody means I have been exposed to this bug at some point in time. I don't know when. I probably don't have an active infection. I mean, I could do, but I'm not sure. Um, I might have cleared it. I might now be clear of the infection as well. If I've just been exposed to the infection, then I'll be negative because my immune system hasn't had a chance to produce antibodies yet. So if I've suddenly been exposed yesterday, I'll have a negative antibody test result. Um, if we give you antimicrobials or antibiotics, then your response might be reduced, but arguably in many cases they're still there. But I can still have antibodies for months after successful treatment. So all it means is I was exposed to this bug at some point. I'm not necessarily sick. I'm not necessarily shedding. I'm not necessarily infectious either. Um, so, okay. <sighs> Maybe it will give us an idea of spread or level of disease if we looked at antibody levels over a group of birds over a long time. Um, but in its isolation, not really that useful. The interesting point, and this goes back to that paper again, looking at what they're recommending in from, from the latest recommendations from the US is they want to combine this with the white blood cell counts of that bird. In other words, how big or how marked is your inflammatory response to this? How sick is it making you feel? And again, looking at liver enzymes, we mentioned the bile acids were critically important. And if your bile acids start creeping up, that's a sign that you've got liver disease. The higher your bile acids, the more severe your liver disease. The more bile acids spill over into your feces and the urine, the more that changes to a yellow greedy color. So this is moving on to now, um, looking at severity of disease. A high level of antibodies doesn't mean you have severe disease, but a high white blood cell count or high liver enzymes might mean you're severely diseased irrespective of what your antibody level is, irrespective of what your PCR is. So if you get a positive PCR, well, your birds are shedding it, whoop de doo dah so do all budgies. Positive antibody test. Well, you've been exposed, but so have all budgies. Um, you know, we realistically need to be going back and looking at this with the clinical signs that you have, severity of disease in that group, pathology in the group. How many birds are dying? How many have nasal discharge? 
what do they look like on diagnostic testing on post-mortem or, or, or you know, clinical diagnostic testing of a live bird. And like you say, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, you probably have a duck unless it's a witch. Tony will not get that reference. I'm sorry, Tony, you're going to have to go and Google Monty Python. Okay, so bringing that all together, trying to get to the point of can we get a diagnosis? I think for me, for best practice for you, um, then yes, okay, there's been some lovely papers out here and bits and pieces looking at how you get your diagnosis. And really here we're looking at PCRs on feces. In this particular study here, they house them in groups of 20, 25 birds, collected a swab or fecal material from the entire group, um, tested them and said, okay, is this group shedding psittacosis to see if they're positive or negative? Um, and that kind of works. And that's doable. That's doable for us. The question is, is if I go down the route of getting a, a diagnosis, uh, and I suppose now I'm looking in a group of birds, which I say they look like a duck, they quack like a duck, they probably are a duck. Um, if I do get a positive PCR, is that going to change what I'm going to do? And that's the whole point of any diagnostic test. Um, if I'm going to run a test and I can go, hmm, makes no difference to me whether it's positive or negative, then I've kind of just wasted your money. Um, if it's positive and it changes what I'm going to do, then it's very pertinent to take that test. Um, and, you know, another COVID reference for you here. If you're positive for COVID, I think on PCR, the way you're going to behave perhaps uh, should be different to how you behave if you were negative and just had a bit of a cough and a cold. Um, maybe it shouldn't. Maybe you should be isolating anyway. Um, but certainly for, from a point of view, if I had a positive PCR and we tested it, the advice I'd give to you as a fancy would be perhaps a bit more robust, a bit more forceful in terms of you've got to go and get yourself tested. And we will be laboring the points of how to treat these more effectively and you would not be allowed to cut corners. And maybe I might start be reaching going, OK, look, you are positive. And my enthusiasm for making you spend money on more extensive or more expensive treatment options available to you would be very pertinent because I want to get this nailed for you. Um, and also scare your friends in the BS as well. Um, that's because they don't really understand how psittacosis works. And obviously any discussion I have with anybody is, is a client confidential matter, which I discuss with individuals. So most people that do end up having a diagnosis of psittacosis, and this is a suspect diagnosis on the base of a PCR, so they don't actually have a diagnosis. A lot of those people then decide not to say anything to anybody because of the ramifications from that, which is a, a shame that people are, uh, the fancy as a whole is that naive. Uh, if we look at post-mortem signs, officially this should be in a dampened carcass in a fume cupboard and we want to look at the spleen, the liver and the air sac because these are the things that are going to change on a post-mortem on a bird uh, if we have psittacosis present. Uh, this is actually some endoscopic pictures here, not of a budgie of, of other birds, but this is a spleen on the left, bigger spleen than it should be, quite an angry looking spleen. Your spleen gets big when it's cross and it's normally cross because you've got some sort of infection. And on the right hand side here, this is a liver now, relatively normal liver, maybe a little bit around him, but not severely diseased. But these are what we're looking for on a post-mortem to see what's going on. And certainly if you're seeing big spleens or big livers on post-mortem, then you want to run away screaming because you've just opened a carcass up with psittacosis and you're staring deeply inside it whilst breathing deeply. Uh, this is also a big spleen on an x-ray here. Again, this is African grey parrot as it happens, but the point is, is, you know, we can diagnose this clinically in birds with antibodies and PCRs and blood tests and looking at livers and looking at things. You know, it can all be done on a bigger bird, I guess, which is economically viable to make a clinical diagnosis and treat that. Um, again, it boils down to economics for um, the budgies, and in a lot of cases, you're going to be thinking you've got the condition, running PCRs, or maybe getting a diagnosis from a post-mortem histopathology, perhaps. And again, big angry spleens. Uh, John, where are we up to time-wise? I'm sensing I've rambled for quite some time. 
John's asleep. Hi, Kevin. It's uh, 25 past eight at the moment. I'm pretty good at guessing an hour, aren't I? You're doing pretty well, yes. Very good. I'm pretty good at guessing an hour. Um, well, shall I go on? Because I think I've got a little bit on incubation period, and, and then we're going to go on to treatment in the second half. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, Thank then you. we'll do that. Well, sorry about that, Kevin. I, I muted myself because of, um, of, of noises that were going on in the place. And then, of course, when you started talking to me, I was chatting away, and uh, only, only I could hear my own voice. I'm, pl I'm pleased you're focused and paying attention to the to the to the wonderful hard effort discussion and, and uh, presentation I'm giving tonight, John. So that that's a real solid endorsement. Thank you so much. Well, I, I have a lot, you know, a lot in common with City Project, so um, it's very of uh, great interest to me. <laughs> right. So, okay. Next thing on our list then is looking at incubation period, as we said. If you're exposed to it, you can get clinical signs within three days to several weeks or never. This is quite important because um, if we're looking at experimental infection here, um, I need to kind of know when I can retest this bird to see if my treatment has been effective, if that makes sense. So um, let's suggest, for example, as we said, if, if we've got a positive bird, we're treating it with antibiotics, we know that stops it shedding, we know testing that point is going to give us a false negative. When I finish treatment, then the question is, is, well, when do I test to see if you're reshedding it again? Do I do it tomorrow, a week's time, two weeks time, a month, six months down the road? How do I know how effective my treatment has been? Have I stopped you shedding this for a long time or not at all? Um, and obviously, if we're looking at retesting a bird, I need to take that sample and go, if this is negative, this is a real negative, not a negative because you've just finished antibiotics, if that makes sense. And again, it boils down to getting a diagnosis. Okay, a suspect diagnosis here, but trusting that sample. And as much as this test is available commercially, um, same with any, any of the vets, to be honest with you, where we've got samples that have been taken by people commercially run to the lab. It's like, well, we don't trust that result. You've no idea how the test works, what the implications are, how to take the samples, how to stop it being cross-contaminated you have no idea. So much as it's available commercially, a vet will not trust your diagnosis because you don't understand, not expected to understand how these things work. Um, basically, um, what you find is if you've got a nasty uh, infection with psittacosis, you'll get shedding within five to 10 days. So in other words, if I treated you, stopped you shedding, I stopped treatment, that virulent infection reactivated immediately after I stopped treatment because I hadn't cleared it, I would expect it to be shedding again in the faeces five to ten days after I stopped treatment. So normally for these, we will be treating for 14 days after the end of treatment to say, have we stopped this thing? Has it to make sure it hasn't reactivated as soon as we finish treatment. And that's where the 14 days come in, is we need to know how long it takes to run a cycle to achieve that. Um, for disease prevention, I think what we'll do now then, oh no, we'll cover quarantine for a bit. We'll cover quarantine for a bit. Um, basically, looking back at this paper, what their recommendations were, was we quarantine. All new birds, all exposed birds, you quarantine. Sick birds, isolate them. Ideally, separate airspace, separate building from other birds, because if they're shedding infectious disease because they're sick and they're going to be shedding more when they're sick, then I don't want them to be shedding it around everybody else. Um, quarantine for psychosis has been arbitrarily set at around 30 days, um, and that's been shown to be beneficial. And this basically is looking at any birds that have been stressed in transit or moving or exposed to other birds. And I'm gonna put in here, um, which will, will obviously is one of the major flaws in, in the current system that we have, maybe not this year, but you should be quarantining your birds for probably about a month after exposing them to other birds. You show them, wonderful, into quarantine for a month. They don't move. Um, which obviously that has quite significant ramifications when you're looking at the show season because you're exposing them to birds on, on Saturday, uh, if your name's Nicola Bird and you're after um, like green CCs 
2021. You might be showing them again on the Sunday. Uh, certainly, you'll be showing them again the next week. And obviously, you can see here, it's like you're, you're, that bird is going to four or five exhibitions in the space of a month with no attempt at quarantine in between at all, at all and mixing with your birds. So exhibiting birds on a regular basis in a live show in a show hall is probably one of the worst things we could do for trying to stop the spread of psittacosis or any infectious disease between the budgerigar fancy. Recommendations of protecting yourself. Just think you've got, you're going to say, see someone who's got COVID, that's probably the same sort of level that we're looking at here. You're looking at um, their recommendations again is gloves, eyewear, visor shield, an N95 mask. And again, all these words now you know because of COVID. The N95 mask stop 95% of particular matter. That's why the that's why the 95 comes in there. Um, but again, this is through very easily transmitted through feather dust and feces. So pretty much your um, COVID precautions match your psittacosis precautions. For controlling the environment, and I think we're, we're going to just stop at this at the end of this slide because I have a break so I want another cup of tea as well. Um, what you need to do is to remove the organic debris and, and there's two reasons for that. One is if you've got poo and seed and dust and everything else, most of the disinfectants you're using, maybe with the exception of iodine, um, cannot work through that stuff. You're inhibiting the effectiveness of the disinfectant. And point number two, particularly when it comes to psittacosis, as we said, it will live for a month in organic debris. You clean that surface, it's only going to live for a fortnight. You've halved the risk of infection from that. So we do need to remove that material. The other thing I would encourage you to do as well, uh, which is sort of a slight aside here, is we know this is transmitted in dust. Okay, things like beacon feather disease or polyoma are, are the same in that effect. And if I dampen my environment down, even if it's just with a detergent, it doesn't have to be with a viricidal disinfectant or anything, but if I dampen the environment down, I don't create dust. That dust doesn't go up into my eyes and my face and my mouth and into the birds. I've dampened it so it's down at floor level or on the cage floor level. So in a lot of cases where people are going to clean out, say you're going to clean out the trays from your bird cages, dampen them down to stop dust formation. Then clean them out because everything is down at that level, it's dampened down, there's no dust, you're not inhaling it, the birds aren't inhaling it. Take all the material out, rinse it, you know, wipe it all down as you can do, get your detergent in there to make it spotlessly clean and then rinse that off. Ideally then, you want to dry it because if you're going to disinfect something that's already covered in water, you're diluting your disinfectant further because it's already damp. So you need a dry surface. Then you stick on your disinfection, uh, the right concentration. You want it wet on the surface and you want the right amount of contact time to have an effect. So realistically for cleaning up the environment generally here, you've got a, a few stages here. Dampen it down to stop dust. Get rid of all the physical debris you can remove, hoover, scraper, whatever you want to do. Detergent, scrub. Rinse it off, dry it, disinfect it, good to go. We'll stop for a tea break, I think, at that point then, and then we'll carry on subsequently. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Kelly. Um, very, very interesting in, indeed. I didn't realise there were so many relationships between um, between the different names for, for basically the same um, disease. Still, you can tell us all about that later, I suspect. Um, but for now, what are we going to do for the next 10 minutes? Put the kettle on and um, chat to me, I suppose. Who haven't I spoke to? Uh, well, I hadn't spoke to day one, but he's cleared off now. He's got to make a cup of tea. How are you doing for questions, John? Sorry? How are you doing for questions? Oh, well, I've got, well, I've got quite a few, thank you. I okay, mean, cool. we'll never get enough, I don't suppose, because we're going to probably have a half hour gap. Yeah. Uh, then again, you never know how long Kevin's going to take to answer one question. Yeah. yeah, this probably be a good opportunity if there are any questions to send them to you, I suppose. 
Yes. Yes. And then like, at least I'll know if I've got to rush rush through them, eh? Yeah. 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 So if anyone else has got any questions, um, send them. Send them to everyone if you can't find uh, me privately. Yeah. Um, I was just going to. Uh, I, was, I just saw a question on there, so it took it took my uh, took me away. This is Terence Terence Rawlings. How are you doing this evening, sir? You're all right. Oh, well done. Glad you you don't have to talk to me because you've been eating. Well, <laughs> I've unmuted myself, so um, I'll, I'm sorry that I'm eating, but I've had company and my wife isn't very well, so I've had to get myself a curry <laughs> and eat it while I'm listening. Oh dear me. Well, I hope the curry doesn't work while we're on here then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, no, 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 anyway, you, you've gone yeah. off. I don't know where you've gone. Lost your oh, picture right. because you want to talk to me. Well, should be there. No, pretty I can see you. Yeah. I can see my own picture. Oh, no, it's got connecting to iPad. I'm sure you'll get it in there. You'll get it in there in the end, anyway. Yep. Yeah. Granville, right. you got in on the end, Granville. We saw you trying to get in earlier on. How are you doing? Granville, you'll have to unmute yourself if you want to talk to me. Yeah, just just give it out an hour, John. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, so I'm having I'm in trouble with a laptop and the bloody um, bandwidth, so I can only do it on the iPad now. Oh well, we got you now anyway, so that's what it's all about. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so, where are we? I think everyone's gone. Nearly everyone's gone for a cup of tea. Let's see who's on the other screen. Let's see who I'm missing. Oh, Kevin Pestle, you're quiet tonight, blimey. Are you, are you gone dumb or what? No, I've not gone dumb. I didn't think you wanted to talk to me. <laughs> I try and get around everybody, you know me. I'll, I've talked to anyone. <laughs> Love talking to you. Tell me, tell me all what you know, Kevin. What do I know? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, it's interesting tonight. You know, you, you're picking up some things like that you, well... Let's say, I haven't got a clue. Yeah. It's the easiest way. Like, you know, it's just little things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you know a little bit, like, you know, that you suspect what could be the problem. But as Kevin's, it's like, vibing, right? It's sort of, um, there's a lot more to it. <laughs> like, you know, it, it's, um, put it this way, it's opened my eyes up a bit to a few things. Yeah, and uh, of course, when he's uh, showing the birds, like all the discharges around the nasals and things like that, there's so many, you know, other sort of uh, things that people are saying, you know, it's this, it's that, you know. I mean, on dare I say, at, on our forum, like you know, there was a one about this nas nasal discharge. Yeah. Like, I think you may have seen it, John, like, you know. Um, to be honest, what Kevin's shown, it's, it's seriously making me think that it's not what people thought it was, like, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm looking and I'm thinking, blimey, all those symptoms there are in the pictures that people were sending. And, that, you know, it's... It's got me seriously worried, put it that way, like, you know, about what, what it could be. Yeah, I suppose none of us know, you know, how, how oh, I was going to say how bad it is, but how, you know, how much of this chlamydia or, or psittacosis there is. I mean, if you go back to the, go back to the 70s, when I, when I caught it and I was four days away from death at, at the most, um, it, it was... Well, it was it was everywhere because the reason being is because there there was uh, there was nothing to stop um, dealers bringing in birds from all over the world and you know ma mainly Africa. It was coming in with the African greys. It was coming in with the uh, the South American species like all the Amazons, and the the birds were so stressed as well. You know they they would put four in an eighteen inch parrot cage. Yeah. You know, keeping them in them in in them pet shops up Club Row, 
And I mean, it was just riddled with psittacosis up there. And I know because I caught it. But a lot of my friends uh, uh, had it as well, much less than I did. But um, I mean, surely now, I mean, why, why would why would there be, I suppose we ought to be asking Kevin this, why would there be psittacosis still about now, unless it's coming in from the feral pigeons? So I shall stick that down. It's, that's a good, it's a good point you say in that, John. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, it, it, it was always the parrots, the parrots, the parrots. Yeah. Like, where it was right. Yeah. Do you think it might have passed on to, yeah, onto the budgies? And, of course, us breeders being ignorant, it's a parrot disease, right? You know, and, like, is it been with a with us for so long that we've just turned blind eyes to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. I mean, no, it's a good point to be truthful, John. I was going to ask, I was going to send that, uh, ask you the question, like to ask Kevin, but you've, you know, that's, it's something that I was picking up on, like, you know, I thought, well, how long, how long has this been with budgets? Like, well, well, technically, it's been there all the time. It just seems like an old, old disease, you know, when you think yeah. about it, 50 years ago since I had it. Um, and what <coughs> you think of it like polio, it's surely it's gone. And if not, why not? Yeah. Well, is it it's the thing, as Kevin's already said, you can stop it or <coughs> halt it from spreading. And then three days to 15 days, it could be back mm. with vengeance, like, you know? Yeah. And I mean, if it can kill us it, as easy as anything, you know, a poor little budgie don't stand a chance, does it? No, oh. oh, that's for sure. Shall we go for part two, guys? Because um, oh, Kevin's come back. Been Kevin's back. Yeah, I've been listening. Yeah, good, good. Well, we've got a question for you, lady. I think about. Yeah, I know. Should we go for it then? Go for it now. Yeah. Why the hell is it still here? I mean, it's like polio. It should have been gone. Yeah, it isn't like COVID that's going to suddenly disappear, according to some... Um, I know, I'll stop, I'll stop being mean. Right, um, okay, so basically, clean before you disinfect, wash it all off, dry it, clean surface. I'll put ferry liquid up here because that's a detergent. Um, it, I suppose the next thing we need to know is what will kill psittacosis in the environment. If environmental contamination is so critically important, as mentioned in that paper, it's, it's one of the top things to do to limit transmission. There's loads of infect, uh, disinfectants that are effective. One I'm picking on here is good old household bleach. One mil of this, 32 mils of water, this is going to get rid of psychosis in your environment. So I certainly use bleach a lot in my birds for a variety of reasons, but this is another one of them. F10 is also effective as well uh, for that. And if you soak everything in your bleach, hey presto, you're, you're, you're done. Um, and like I say, I'm, I'm lucky that I have this tub that's big enough for all my wire cages. Um, so everything just goes in, has a soak through bleach after it's been cleaned or cleaned, rinsed, then soaked in bleach uh, for 20 minutes and then it comes out again and is reused. So very cheap and cheery way of doing it and it is effective against your psittacosis. So this is obviously part of an integral plan for control. Then we start thinking about what about these birds that are sick? We mentioned that this is an intracellular bacteria. Okay, it's in the cells. So routine antibiotics are not going to work against this. Um, and in fact, routinely prophylactically giving antibiotics just in case is also um, very much discouraged. Now, those of you going back to picking up on the, the lovely quarantine chat, um, those of you that are old enough to remember all the greys and, and Amazons all kicking off and dying with psittacosis, a lot of the birds that are imported in large numbers at that time, and certainly even going back 20 years, a lot of the pet shops at that time, they would all have them on antibiotics as a routine through the entirety of quarantine, uh, either from being imported or quarantined into the uh, pet stores. And I even know of pet stores when I was in practice starting. Uh, I was 
fortunate enough to be um, the first vet in the UK to work in a pet superstore. Um, and at that time, they were basically routinely treating all of their birds for psittacosis throughout the entire duration of sale on the shop floor. Um, and basically that treatment stopped at the moment you picked up the bird and took it home. But until that point, they were all on routine antibiotics in water for psittacosis. Not best practice, but um, nevertheless, that I guess gives you an idea of the, the, the scale of this problem. And certainly from a pet shop point of view, if you go into a pet shop, wander around, go home and get psittacosis, and that's the only bird you've been exposed to. The human health implications here and ramifications for that pet store is quite marked, extending way beyond the death of a few budgies or lovebirds or cockatiels. Um, so much as we, 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 we have got ways that we can treat it, the fact of the matter is, is because this can hide in the cells of this bird, and when it's hiding in the cells of this bird, it's sitting there, doesn't have to replicate, it can just sit there for as long as it likes. Anything can cause that to come out again, six months down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road. In the cases of the pet parrots, for example, as you were saying, John, it could be 15, 20 years. You know, I could have had that bird at home for 15 years and not have a single clinical problem. It gets another disease that stresses us out or lowers its immune system. Psittacosis goes mental. And all of a sudden I've got an infectious bird that hasn't been infectious for the last 20 years. Um, so once you've got a positive bird or a positive collection, your collection is positive, permanently considered positive through whatever generation subsequently happened because it's always possible to reactivation. So you can never guarantee you are infected because obviously you're going to have a suspect case probably, but you can also never guarantee that you're not infected. If we want to get treatment into these birds, we know that if you're sick, you probably aren't drinking or eating as much as you should do. And that's partly why you're losing weight. So if we want to be effective at treating birds that we think have this condition, or we've got a positive PCR or what have you, then we've got to give you two ways. I'm either gonna crop feed you with the medication so that I know you have got it into your crop and that's that, hoping you're not gonna regurgitate it, um, or I might inject it. I'm gonna give you an injection and I know you've had the injection and that's that. If I put it in food, put it in water, who knows if you're, you're, you're getting a level that's effective. The next question you have with, a, with a, an infection like this that's good at hiding is, well, how long do I treat for? Um, and there's no real guaranteed protocol. And, and, and I guess this is why the, the traders who are putting their birds through 35 days quarantine and the pet shops the same, we're just going, I don't know how long to treat for, you know what, I'm just going to continuously treat until the end of time. Um, certainly historically, uh, and perhaps the treatment has been suggested has been changed, but 45 days used to be the recommended duration of treatment. Um, again, this is coming from this paper where 30 days of treatment can be effective. And the, treat, the word here is can uh, be effective. Um, there's also some recent work showing that maybe 21 to 30 days is also adequate. Um, the recommendation is, however, if you are going to go for a shorter treatment duration, then you must be retesting PCR two to four weeks after treatment, as we said, to see if there's any shedding. Um, and like I say, we do know um, that if you're treating, you're going to get reduced shedding really within the first 24, 48 hours of treatment, uh, which is great, but it may mean you get a negative test result but it also probably means a human health risk has been markedly diminished because you're no longer actively shedding the infectious agent. I stick with the 45 days treatment, to be honest with you. Um, we haven't moved on to treatment yet, but I've, I've let the, the cat out of the bag here with the word doxycycline. But um, basically the, the, the way that doxycycline works as uh, an antibiotic is uh, different to some of the other agents. It's what we call bacteria static. So it doesn't kill the bacteria, it stops them reproducing. 
Um, so what? So if you've got the psittacosis bug hiding in a cell and it's not replicating, it's just sitting there and doing nothing, your doxycycline is not going to get rid of it. It's only when that, if you like, infectious particles decide to replicate and shed from that, that shed, the, the, the cell, that the doxycycline is actually going to work. So because it hide, hides in these cells dormant for as long as it likes, you can never clear out the infection. Because as soon as it decides it wants to reactivate, boom, you get clinical disease. Now, one of the main, I guess, ways in which the body reacts to psittacosis is by raging a, a massive white cell count, uh, monocy monocytes, which is the sort of chronic inflammatory cell, that, 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 typical for all species, to be honest. Um, what we know is when this bacteria is engulfed by these cells, and it's sitting there inside that cell, the doxycycline cannot treat it. It cannot get in there to be effective. We know in birds that these monocytes that, that do their best to control this infection, their lifespan's 42 days. So if I had 100 monocytes in my body today, in 42 days, I will have 100 different monocytes in my blood because that's how long they last for. So the logic for the 45 day treatment historically for this has been if this infection is hiding in my white blood cells out of the way where my antibody cannot deal with it and I treat for longer than the anticipated lifespan of that white blood cell, at some point that infection has to jump ship. It has to leave the dying cell and go and find a new cell that's not dead. And when it does that, that's when my doxycycline can hit it. That's when I've got my one chance at getting, you know, maximum kill effect for this infection. So that's why the 45 days has been put in there historically. And to be honest, that's why I still recommend the 45 days is continued because I want to exceed the white cell lifespan in these birds. The other thing that's very relevant if we're going to start using doxycycline as a treatment here. Calcium will bind up the doxycycline and prevent it from being absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract into the bird. So all your calcium mineral supplements, oyster shell, mineral blocks, cuttlefish, all needs to go. If you're in a hard water area, the calcium carbonate in your tap water will bind the doxycycline and prevent it from being absorbed. So we want any calcium source of any description to be removed from the birds for the duration of treatment. We also need any of the sources of moisture to be removed during that treatment because budgies will, given the option when they are drinking something that is tainted with a vitamin, a mineral or a treatment, they will choose water that doesn't have it in. They will choose something else. So if you're feeding a soft food or they're out on an outside flight and it rains, for example, uh, or you're going to give them a little bath today, you are just going to limit the effectiveness of your in-water treatment. We're already struggling here to, to have an effective treatment, so we have to optimise the chances of our success rate. And these are two very important points for treatment that we need to be very mindful of if we're going to have the best chance we've got an effective treatment. Now, um, I say this repeatedly every month, and I'm going to say it again because it, I just have to. Budgies are not pigeons, okay? In the same way that you are not a cow or a tiger, they are not a pigeon. If you look at mils of water drunk per kilo, okay, pigeon, passerines, chickens, they drink far more than a budgie would do. So the dose for in-water treatment for this condition is going to have to be specific for those species, specifically for citizens. And in fact, it's not even specific for citizens. It's specific down to individual species of citizens. It varies between cockatiels and budgies and African greys and cockatoos, the levels that you need within the water, let alone 
pretending they're a pigeon. So if you rush out and buy a pigeon product, which let's be honest, all of you do because you know if it's a pigeon product, it's got to be good enough for a budgie, right? Because you know pigeons are just big budgies. Uh, then you're basically, if you're going to use the pigeon dosages on these products, you will fail to treat it. You're just going to get resistance, and the birds will not be effectively treated at all. It's completely irresponsible to do that. Um, the other thing I should, uh, before we go, go on to complain about Triple C, um, the, the other thing with the doxycycline is, is this is called a, a steady state antibiotic. And what you need, and this goes back to if you're thinking about a lot of antibiotics you'd be treating yourself with perhaps, you need to get a level in your birds that is consistent all the way through for that 45 day period. If you have one day where that level drops, one hour where that level drops below the level that's acceptable, the infection could reactivate itself and the clock goes back to zero and you have to start another 45 days. So this is something that needs to be consistently given and consistently reaching the levels in the bloodstream of that bird day in, day out, hour in, hour out, every second of every day for 45 days to be effective. So triple C, everybody uses triple C. Those of you that were very old, um, and there's a fair few in the audience, but you'll remember oreomycin. Uh, green powder in a tub, 500 gram tub, you used to buy, you used to chuck it around all over the place. This is what all the traders used to use, the importers used to use. You'd go in and the water would just be that yellowy sort of colour. Maybe a slight variation into, into oxytetracycline. Um, but these are the products that we used to use. And chlortetracycline, which is, I guess, got three C's in it, is why it's called triple C. Um, um, but this is just giving you an example here of um, the sort of amounts that you would need to give. So parrots, five grams per litre. Finches and pigeons are at half that level. Random ornamental birds, you know, five grams per kilo in food, this sort of type of thing. What we can say about triple C or chlortetracycline as a product generally for antibacterial action, but also specifically for psittacosis, is this is the most pointless waste of time possible that's just going to induce resistance. This is not a product that should be marketed. This is not a product that should be used. Oromycin and teromycin, for those of you that are very old, oromycin, the chlortetracycline used to be added to milk for calves to stop diarrhea. Uh, teromycin, which is the alternative to being green, was orangey yellow. Um, again, the older people here will know this was used as a routinely thing as basically an in-food additive for a lot of farm species as, as a growth promoter. Um, and the spillover was obviously into the avian market for control and chlamydia and things as well. And it's not effective. But if you use it continuously and you're trying to stop shedding to stop it spilling over into causing people, or you're making the birds look vaguely healthy before you send, some, send them off to somebody's house, or to some unsuspecting pet shop where you, you know, from your import, then this is why we had such a disaster with, with psittacosis. Uh, disaster generally with these birds, to be honest, uh, from a welfare point of view. So, no, no, no. Core tetracycline, triple C, pointless, don't use it. If somebody is recommending you use it, that's because they don't understand and they don't know, they have no idea what they're talking about and they should just be quiet. Tetracycline, the same. The only tetracycline that we've got out there that has a fighting chance of being helpful and effective here is the doxycycline. Um, we know with oromycin and oxytetracycline, water consumption drops off. We know they're not going to be effective. We know you're going to get false negatives. You really are just clouding the subject for no real benefit. Um, this actually is an interesting one here. We, we, this is Ornimed, and again, you've probably never heard or used it. It's quite an old thing now, but this is where they were looking at in feed chlortetracycline as opposed to in water chlortetracycline. And this actually worked, um, which is quite interesting. And, and there is some more recent work showing that in food treatment tetracycline 
does work. Parakeets here, of course, is an old thing from 1984. That translates to budgie. But this did work, but we can't get it anywhere. Um, so doxycycline is your treatment of choice. Um, the absorption is more complete in terms of absorption from the GI tract. It's spread more widely in the tissue, so it's not focused in one bit or the other. It's spread more evenly. This is a systemic disease affecting the whole of the bird. So the more I can get into the system, the more widespread it's moved into tissues, the better it is. Much as we hate calcium, it's less of an issue for doxy than the others, but I would still be eliminating calcium completely from the diet. It also is, elimination is slower than the um, chlortetracycline or, or oxytetracycline. So you put all that together, in a lot of species, I can use a lower dose but still be effective. And by using a lower dose, maybe you'll drink more of it. Maybe um, I can administer it less frequently. In other words, twice a day probably is okay. Maybe with tetracycline and chlortetracycline, I should be doing four times a day if, you know, if I was going to direct dose into the crop, for example. So, the other thing that's very interesting when you, when you look at pigeons, and now I'm going to pick on um, pigeon treatment now. And I went through a sort of a, uh, your Merca systems are obviously a very good site for getting all sorts of miscellaneous rubbish of illegal imported drugs. Um, and the UK government have no way of controlling the import of, of pharmaceuticals from overseas. Hence, you can get all of these things which you'd never get dispensed to you in the UK. But just an example, pharma here, ornithosis cure. It doesn't contain a single product effective against psittacosis. Not one. We've got another one here, which okay, contains doxy, fluorphenicol, chlorophenicol derivative, again, not very useful. Parastop, again, also promoted for psittacosis, contains norfloxacin, which is a sister drug to endrofloxacin, i.e. Batrol. Um, not really effective against psittacosis either. Ornimix does contain doxycycline alone. Okay, that's a nice starting point. Bronco Sprint, I love that. I mean, let's be honest, that's quite a good collection of drugs in Bronco Sprint. You've got oxytetracycline and chlortetracycline. That's like me taking ibuprofen and neurofen at the same time. It, they're the same thing. Well, they're not, they're both rubbish, but the, the point is, is you've got a mixture of two drugs from the same drug class. It is just a ridiculous product. Um, and again, irresponsible uh, treatment, to be honest. And I, I stopped at this point. I went through and, and I just found brand after brand after brand of stuff you could import illegally. And it was just ridiculous. So if we go back to common sense first, and I've got psittacosis, and I'm thinking I need to treat for psittacosis. You want doxycycline and look at the label on your product and buy something that just contains doxycycline with the concentration on the side. And if it's a polypharmacy product and it doesn't tell you um, what's in it, don't buy it. It's not relevant. Buy a straight doxycycline product. Now, here's a wonderful list of some of the pigeon bird generally doxycycline powders available. They're all straight doxycycline, they're all perfectly legitimate and viable, you've just got to pick one. But you're going right the way through on these. Bottom right, we have doxyrom here, 10%. Okay. Doxycycline in the middle, 20%. So clearly when we're looking at these, we've got to know how much doxycycline is in each gram of this product for me to have a fighting chance at getting the right dose that you need. And bear in mind, these are pigeon products. These are going to give you the dose for a pigeon on the side of them, not the dose for a budgerigar, not the dose for a cockatiel, not the dose for an African grey parrot, not the dose for a cockatoo. This is quite a common disease we're dealing with here. So there's been lots of studies looking at the doses that individual species need. So the doses on the side of these are for pigeons and they're based on the concentration in that product. 
So you might say, oh yeah, I use doxycycline a teaspoon to a pint, woohoo. But it depends on what concentration you've got. So to be honest, if you're doing this yourself with no input from a professional, you're wasting your time. And again, you're inciting resistance and not solving your problem. This was my favorite. This was obviously aimed at the poultry bird industry. We get a lot of uh, mycoplasmal related respiratory disease in, in poultry, ranging from chickens right the way through to pheasants and, and everything else as well. And I just thought a brand name of snot mix for then this is this actually is a doxycycline product. Um, I just thought it was inspirational. Whoever came up with that was brilliant. Just just excellent. So yeah, snot mix. Right. Let's go back to pigeons, which budgies are not. If you look at the recommendations for what dosage levels we use for pigeons, they're normally around about 75 to 100 milligrams per litre of doxycycline in the water. So your pigeon product is probably going to be pitching to get that sort of level, depending on how concentrated the product is in the first place. Now, this is a quite a nice, entertaining study here, uh, looking at hidden water medication in budgerigars for its effectiveness against psittacosis. And you'll see a few of these charts coming through now based on, on this particular study. The top line, the therapeutic concentration, as I said, is this is the minimum level we need. We need the level in the blood of your budgie to be pitching over that line continuously for 45 days for this product to be effective. Okay, now if you look down at the bottom here, what I've done is I've taken some of the things out by, by deleting them off, but basically this, um, these dots on here represent budgies that were given pigeon doses. Okay, the vast majority of budgies that were given pigeon doses of doxycycline, they couldn't even measure it properly because it was below the lower limit that the test would quantify it at. And all of them fell realistically, probably below half the level they should have had. It is beyond ineffective. It is completely pointless and useless. So those of you that have used oxycycline on the basis of a pigeon dose that a mate told you, you've just, I'm afraid, been given some irresponsible information from somebody that doesn't know. If we um, translate that over to some of these products on here, this is another one here. This is, this is doxycycline 20%. Um, and to be honest, I've got no objection in you going for products that are more concentrated. Normally you find out they work out more economical. But this has beautiful pictures of an African gray and, and a blue and gold macaw and a yellow headed Amazon on the front and a little Goldian finch and I'm going to go for that being some sort of pied budgie on the right, but uh, I, you know, it could be a love bird. My eyes aren't very good. But the fact of the matter is, is when you work this out, the dose it's recommending on a product that's got parrots on the side of it is 130 mg per mil. That is four times less than a dose we know doesn't work in budgies. Okay, it's a quarter of an ineffective dose which is so ineffective, it's pointless. And this is a product that's marketed with a pretty parrot on the front that would make you think you're doing and making the right choice. Okay, so the question is, is how much doxycycline do you need for a bird to be effective for treatment? We need to hit the target of one, okay? This pretty much is it. This is based on a study in turkeys, actually, which I know we don't really have the study in budgies, but in turkeys, if you've pitched over one are uh, in the bloodstream for the length of time, it was effective at treatment. And that's kind of where we've, we're assuming that a budgie requires the same blood level as a turkey or the same as anything else. It's the same agent, so it's a reasonable jump of faith. And this, they're actually looking at doxycycline and enrofloxacin slash Batril for psittacosis. Uh, and Batril does have some activity, but it's not on my list of things to be recommending to you for all the reasons we've mentioned so far. Um, this is a, another nice one. This is now looking at cockatiels, uh, looking at injection in feed and in water. 
medication for psittacosis. And there's a whole bunch of these. And this is another paper here looking specifically now saying, okay, what level of doxycycline do we need in budgerigars and seed? What level of doxycycline do we need in water to hit this magical unit of one in their blood to be effective? So we, we, the research is there, we know. So we know, and this gives you an idea here, for um, cockatiels, we need realistically two to four times a pigeon dose. For cockatoos, we need up to six times a pigeon dose. For the African greys, we need eight times a pigeon dose. So it's a massive variation across the species in terms of what is effective. In all the other species, we don't really know. Most people are pitching in at 400 milligrams per litre. So that's four to five times a pigeon dose as a bog standard. My lovebird's got psittacosis, what shall I give it? You generally pitch at this level. The interesting thing from this paper is they recommended that you did not use medicated water for budgies because it didn't achieve the levels necessary to be effective for treatment. In other words, the conclusion from this paper was that in water doxycycline is pointless to treat psittacosis in budgery gas. Um, works in cockatiels, very annoyingly. Uh, and this is just an, another uh, little look at the paper here. Um, but basically, this was them uh, looking at that and looking at their blood levels here. Um, and you can see here their blood levels were basically pitching in around 2, 2.8, um, which obviously we said we want a minimum value of 1. Um, so this, this obviously, at the 400 milligrams per litre for the cockatiels was pitching in at twice the level you wanted. So, you know, we know this was being effective. So that's quite nice. But we know not all birds are the same. We know not all citizens are the same. So unfortunately, whereas we might have a dose for cockatiels and coughing cockatoos and grey parrots, the question is, is does it, this work in a budgery gar? So again, this is that paper, lots of information there. I've actually put it into the files area on the health care page. So you've got this as a reference point, as well as the national recommendations from, from the US. All these references are there as a long-term archive, along with the lectures too. So you can always go back to this in five years, 10 years, and obviously they'll be updated anyway, but they're there as a permanent resource for members. Um, but basically, we've got on, on this particular paper here is during a 14 day period when they were assessing them, treatment at 400 mg per litre didn't keep this blood level over one. And interestingly, having it added to seed did, which was great, but they were adding it to dehust seed as the sole food source for those birds. Not seed with hus husking, you know, not normal seed, it's dehull, dehust. To, to ensure that they got it. So much as that might be a way to do that, you're then gonna to have to source seed that's been dehusked, mix in doxycycline powder to that, probably with corn oil or something, or, or, or cool gelatin to stick it to the surface of the seed or the seed kernels uh, to have an effect, which I guess you could do, but maybe that's a bit impractical. Um, the other conclusions that they, they mentioned on here is when they were looking at it and they, they tested levels at 50, 100, 200 and 400. None of them hit that golden target of one. Um, they then said, well, what if we did give them 800? What if we did give them 1,000? Um, and the fact of the matter is, is there wasn't much of a jump between the 200 and 400 in terms of the serum levels achieved in the birds. And their argument was as if you gave the increased concentration of doxycycline to the to budgery gars, they probably would drink less and therefore putting more in wasn't going to help the effectiveness. It all boils down to how palatable the water was. The interesting thing here, and this is showing you the rest of the data that they, they presented in that paper, we're now interested in looking primarily here at the open square. Um, and this is showing you the blood levels in um, the budgies with uh, like I say, that treatment at, at 400 mg per, per litre. And you can see there's a few of them here that, that are pitching in at the, the level you perhaps would like. There's also a few that are pitching well down below the level you would like. 
And if we take the rest of the data out of the way, which I've just done here, you can see there's a, a massive spread of blood levels based on availability, I guess, absorption and, and water intake. But it was effective in some individuals, but not effective in all individuals. So great, four of you are probably pitching in relatively good. You lot, you're not. So variable, very variable results, I would say for this. And if you look at 200 and 400, they're saying there wasn't a lot of difference. Arguably there probably is, because the, the 200 never pitched up to the same level as the 400. I, I personally would interpret this as a positive sign that 400 did have a greater effectiveness over the 200. And again, it's looking at spread of data uh, and statistical analysis, I guess. But to me, looking at that chart, the 400 did have a greater impact in, in balance, looking at the levels achieved in some of the births. Um, so I don't know. I mean, they never went back and tested higher concentrations because they said it was pointless, probably because they ran out of money or funding or time or a combination of the above. Um, and I'm not sure I would have completely agreed with that as a conclusion. Uh, it's okay. Would have been nice to have known though, wouldn't it? Would have been nice to have done 800 milligrams doxycycline per litre in the drinking water say, did it make any difference? Let's get conclusive evidence here versus someone trying to make an educated conclusion on what information they've got available. Now, you can give it directly by crop tube, okay? If you want to give doxycycline directly by crop tube into your birds, then you can do that. And this is the doses that you need to be effectiveness. And you drop down to the bottom here, it's up to 50 mg per kg once a day or every day is recommended for your citizen species. So realistically, if I was gonna be treating these by crop tube, I'd be giving them 25 mg per kg twice a day uh, by crop tube to guarantee they're getting the amount that I wanted to. Um, and we do do this in, in a variety of, of things. This could be back to going back to dosing with metronidazole, for example, or directly crop tubing with amphotericin to guarantee your bird gets the product you want versus relying on something in water. And so we do that, but I can't do that for a couple of hundred budgies. I could, but it would be annoying, particularly if I had to do it for 45 days. We do actually have vibromycin effervescent tablets, which are used for people, which work quite nicely. These are water soluble. They produce a lovely little greeny concoction of the doxycycline. Um, equally perfectly fine. Get them, dose them. You can do direct oral dosing for individual bird. Maybe that's very special to you that you want to try and save from this. Then this is a suitable route. Um, again, if you're going in food treatment, you've got to uh, have de -hust. You've got to use the kernels. You've got to have the right formulation, the right concentration. Um, and like I say, you know, US practices has shown that it's, it's, it's worked. Um, but again, I'm not sure how practical it is for people. And again, it all boils down to, is this actually going to be effective? Um, this was the sort of uh, in-food treatment they utilized in this study. And they just basically used doxycycline powder, which again, you could use from, from the water soluble powder. It's the same product. Um, but this is what they did every day, um, using sunflower oil actually to blend it in, to mix it in so it coats the surface of the, of the kernels. Um, but this was the sort of food protocol they used in that particular study. Now, if we go back to injections, um, we are lucky that we do have doxycycline injection. Um, this basically is a human IV product. They use quite widely in people for, for these sort of intracellular resistant bacteria. Um, so if you're critically ill with psittacosis and go to hospital, you'll be given IV doxy. Um, what we do know with doxycycline is it runs through the liver, but it enters into what we call the enterohepatic circulation. Um, and because this is excreted in the sort of bile acids and goes round in the circulation, that are sick, you actually get, if you like, a sustained release of doxycycline from what is a single injection. And this allows us to treat a patient every five to seven days. Quite a big dose, but you give them a dose, you leave them alone for a week, and you give them another dose. Um, and so it's quite hands-off. So certainly for a lot of the bigger citizens, for example, where people aren't going to be dosing 
uh, macaw by mouth. It's not going to be drinking stuff at home. They can come to the vets once a week, have an injection for six weeks, and then you're pretty much you've done the best you can treatment wise. You do get irritation at the treatment site. Some birds will start actually feather plucking yourself, traumatizing that injection site, which we do sometimes see in the bigger citizens. So a blue and gold macaw, for example, or a green wing macaw will be having five mils um, of injectable doxycycline, which is a ginormous dose. Those of you who have IM injections of B12 and are getting 0.2 or 0.3 mils put into your bottom, you'll know how painful that is. You scale that up 20 fold, 25 fold, and then that's for a, you know, a 70 kilo person. You switch that down to a 700 gram bird and then you can see why they start self-traumatizing. This hurts. There's loads of injectables out there. We, we get them on special import, uh, or German products primarily. Uh, Vibravenos is one, um, doxycycline is another, but we, we basically import them under special license. Uh, and then obviously these are very effective to be used. Um, and like I say, you get your jab, you work out how much you need for your budgie. Um, your average budgie is sort of, you know, 60, 80 grams in weight. If we're gonna use 100, mix per kg that translates to them wanting ah uh, he says now thinking why did i suddenly give myself some maths to do um but they're probably going to be down to about sort of five or six milligrams say five milligrams for ease of purposes this is 20 mg per mil that therefore for means i need to give 0.25 mils to a budgie once a week it's a reasonable volume uh, that's going to annoy them this we have to give into the keel, uh, into the petrol muscle mass. They will hemorrhage, they will hate it. You need to put digital pressure on here and you should be holding up to a minute afterwards to stop the risk of uh, inadvertent hemorrhage from that. Other options you've got, azithromycin is one, which is azithromycin suspension, a human product again. It's expensive, it does work. We don't know if it works in budgies, I wouldn't really use it. Um, and you know, there's been there's been papers on it showing that it's kind of effective, but for me, it's not on the list of things I'd be recommending for you. Um, macrolides, like I say, have some effect, and we go back to this product here: tylosin, thymine, and lithromycin. They're three macrolides. You know, again, it, it's like you know having chips, mashed potato, and waffles for your tea. They're all just potato. It's the same sort of style thing, really. And to bait sure your enrofloxacin, it will stop shedding, but it's not effective. It's not a product you want to be using for these as well. Doxycycline is your product of choice. It's just a question of how you get it into them. Uh, another snotty nose, that might be the last picture it is. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, what I might do just before I stop is if you said to me, what is my recommended treatment protocol after the, the evening of depression. Um, to be honest, if you're gonna do it, put doxycycline in water at 400 mg per litre, remove all calcium sources, remove all moisture available for any other bird, treat for 45 days. If you're enthusiastic and you've got birds that are showing marked clinical signs, then inject them. Use injectable doxycycline. We know it works. Um, that can be done effective at eliminating infection from those. And I would be targeting the birds that are clinically affected, the worst diseased birds, the sickest birds, um, to try and maximise your impact on that. And any bird that clinically isn't responding to doxycycline injections is a bird that you say goodbye to. Um, and I suppose having done all that, I wouldn't be recommending necessarily routine treatment with doxycycline. As I say, the effectiveness is, is questionable at best. Um, you're going to monitor for your clinical signs. And if it looks like a duck or quacks like a duck and you've hit critical mass that you think routine treatment is necessary, then I would be encouraging you to get proper veterinary advice on your dosing and structure and cleaning to eliminate this and not rely on Facebook or um, budgie fanciers who pretend they know things when in fact they don't. Um, John, yes. question time. Yes, thank you very much for this evening, Kevin. But, uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a few more questions for you. Um, and the first one here is, 
how would I get injectable treatment uh, if I wanted to do that? Okay, so getting the injectable treatment isn't necessarily easy. Um, it's not licensed in the UK. And your vets basically are controlled by UK legislation. So I can. Um, whereas you can because you're out with the veteran profession, so that would happen. But this is a human IV product, it's prescription only. So at the minute in the UK, we have exemption from the Veterinary Medicines Directorate in that normally if I want to import a drug, I have to present a case to them saying, I need this drug for this patient with this disease. This is my diagnosis. Please, can I import some uh, specifically for this case? And they go, oh, that seems you've made a reasonable case. Knock yourself out and go ahead. You put a prescription to the pharmaceutical company and say, please, can I have this? Here's the paperwork from the UK government allowing me to import it. You import the product and then you treat specifically that, patient, that named patient on a named premises with a named vet. And that's how it works. But your birds are dead from psittacosis long before the products even arrived and hit the country. I was going to say that, but I thought I'd leave that to you. Um, so there is an exemption for the injectable... Um, doxycycline because it's not a vaccine or anything that's going to have a major issue particularly it's a commonly used product in that the practices if they are set up with the vmd they are allowed to have a certain amount in stock for use for their patients and in fact this product is sitting in the uk with the drug companies they just need you to give them the paperwork to send it across so the practices that use it on a regular basis they will have it sitting in their pharmacy and they're able to use it routinely on these birds uh, or we use it in our cats for example for certain cat diseases as well in our hospital um, as standard and that's that's the sort of exemption they've made it's a fairly innocuous product it's doxycycline and we've got that your normal vet will not really have any need or urge to have special imports of doxycycline sitting in their cupboard and nor will they have the paperwork set up with the vmd to do that so if you want injectable doxy, you kind of need to be going to the right place to get it and to have the right instruction to use it and have sufficient clinical justification for its use. One vial of doxycycline, which is designed for single use IV human use, um, costs about £90 uh, and technically you want to discard it within a week. Next question, John. Yes. Well, I, sp I suppose it should follow on that how long is the treatment? If, if you've got to discard that within a week, if you were going to do the injectable uh, route, how, how long is the treatment? Six weeks, 42 uh, days. Times 90 quid, forget it then. Yeah? Okay. Right. Um, a member asks, what are the chances of my birds already having the infection? Obviously, he doesn't know that they have. Yeah, um, we know that, that budgies carry this for fun. And I think if I went around and swabbed your birds' sheds and looked for, did the PCR for psittacosis, probably 50% of you will turn up positive on that PCR. Everybody's got it. That's Pretty much. Bit, a bit like the FM and, the, you know, every, yep. mm -hmm. everything then, by the sounds of it. Yep, pretty much. MRSA job. Right, okay. Thank you. Um, the, the next question is in two parts. It's been asked by a member and, and he asks, is there any other drug that, you, that can be used instead of the uh, doxycycline? And, and at the same time, I, I would like to ask pretty much the same question, but I, I seem to remember back in the 70s, um, that they wanted to dose me up with penicillin, which I couldn't take, and they had to give me something else. So if I'm right about it being in the 70s, why are they not using penicillin now? Okay, so question number one is no, use doxycycline. Azithromycin, the macrolides, or things like that, or um, enrofloxacin, Batrol, nah, they're not effective. They might stop shedding, they might help, they might reduce clinical signs, 
but they're not going to deal with this as an infection to try and control it. It's, it's putting a Band-Aid on a fracture. It just isn't going to work. I have no idea why they want to give you penicillin, John. They're completely barking up the wrong tree. Um, your antibiotics act in different ways. A lot of the normal antibiotics, and this is penicillin into that category, they act on bacterial cell walls to do their damage. The psittacosis agent, the chlamydia, is an intracellular bacteria that doesn't have a cell wall. This makes them incredibly resistant and refractile to routine treatment like penicillins. So, no, that isn't going to work. You've got to have very specific antibiotics that target these agents, and doxycycline is one of the very few that can deal with these sorts of um, agents. The downside you've got because of the way it works, as we said, you've got to have it in the bloodstream for a long time. You know, if you're going to be treating um, these sort of infections, you've got to treat for a long time period. And even if you're looking at human diseases that, that where doxycycline is, is used, <laughs> I put Lyme disease into this category because that's quite topical for the minute for our household. But the fact of the matter is, is you've got to treat for a month. You know, this isn't something that goes away in a second or two. It, it's, you, you need the doxy, you need it for a long duration. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone asks, if I get chlamydia from a breeder, should I tell him? That's a very good question. Yeah. So, uh, and I suppose this boils down to, to ethics, okay? Um, and there's been actually some quite interesting, from the human side, quite interesting as well, cases um where oh, i'm trying to think what they were now it's, it's basically where you've got genetic defects in 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 people um you know where you you know for example you're a carrier of a, of a genetic defect you pass it on to your children you choose not to tell your children because that's your personal data this is my personal client confidentiality it's your relationship with the hospital you know you've passed it on to your children they have grandchildren have clinical signs having no idea they've risked passing a, a genetic defect that you'd carried into the grandchildren. That has been some cases that have hit the human press because of them, you know, who, who is responsible for that? Should the NHS have actively or whoever disclosed personal information to somebody else because it's going to impact on them? So if you've got psittacosis, and the question is, is, how do you know you've got it? And we've been through that whole discussion of you probably can't confirm you've got it, even though you, you, know, you think you have. It's your personal data. Um, and, you know, on the health group that we've got running now, I would probably say, uh, and this is being honest and real, probably 75% of the queries I get about Butchie's Health from members of that group come through me on PM they're not disclosed on the group openly to other people. It's your personal data. You don't have to tell anybody. You know, unfortunately, what the fancy is like. You know what people are like, and it's the fancies that need to change to save our hobby, not BS or anything else. Stop being mean to each other and just be open about the fact that we have these diseases present and deal with them. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is most people that have these sort of conditions they don't want people to know because of backbiting, et cetera, et cetera, and everything else. And, and it's the brave person that sticks a hand in the air and say, actually, I have this problem in my birds. This is how I'm dealing with it and sorting with it. And it's an endemic problem. But in answer to your question for psittacosis, if you think you've got it and you've sold birds to somebody else or a bird came to you and you think that bird brought it into your stud, this transmits to people. Okay. And if you don't have it on your radar and that person is having problems with disease, then you tell them. The big question you have, and I think most people in the fancy, again, do the same thing. I've seen it repeatedly. If you get a bird in and it's infectious and you brought it in and you stuck it in your shed and all of a sudden you have an outbreak. OK, psittacosis, so that's what we're discussing. Well, of course, it's the supplier's fault, isn't it? They sold you a sick bird. Got nothing to do with the fact that you chose to buy a sick bird or stick it in your shed with all your other birds or not disease test it or screen it or quarantine it. You just chucked it in there because, well, it's not your fault, it's their fault. You're going to instantly blame them and decide to have an argument with them. Well, I'm sorry, it's your stupidity. 
you took that bird and you put it in your shed with no quarantine and no treatment and let it run riot. That's your fault. But it's a risk we all take. You went to the show and brought back a bird with psittacosis. That's a risk you've chosen to take. So take it on the chin, have an open discussion with the person you got the bird from, say, look, I'm not blaming you because it's an endemic disease. It's all over the place. It could happen to anybody. Just let you know I've had some birds go down with this. You were the last person I had birds from, and I'm just letting you know, just in case you see problems in yours or something that you might want to be responsible and take action for. So for all of these things, it's how you pitch it. And most people will pitch in aggressively back to their supplier, which just doesn't get results. And it doesn't help us to manage these conditions generally because you're always, it's always somebody else's fault. Yeah. Next question, John. Thank you very much. Did I treat um, for, uh, for this disease annually? That's an interesting question because the, the, the ones that the, the, the outbreaks that I've dealt with, I guess the question is, is knowing that we don't know that we can eliminate it effectively. Now this goes back to the people importing citizens just routinely treating with oreomycin in the water all day long or the pet shops. It kind of is a bit irresponsible and, uh, and, and if we're going to try and do it properly and withhold calcium from the birds, as those of you went to the talk last month, you know how critical that is as well. And to actively withhold that's also quite questionable. And I've got to breed the birds at some point, I guess. So for me, I would probably be saying no. If you've got clinical signs of disease that warrant detailed, active, proactive um, treatment to try and eliminate it in one go and hit it as hard as you possibly can do then absolutely go ahead and I would be treating everybody because we know there's lots of clinically silent birds but then you're making a singular concerted effort over a 42 day period to hit everybody the question then is is do I need to treat again and the answer probably is no but I'm guessing if you're starting to see signs of clinical disease creeping in birds, and it's not just the one now, it was three or it was four or half a dozen, um, you know, when you're looking at the quantity of birds coming through where you're starting to express concern about that, then yes, I would be treating again, and then you may have to. But if you treat them as effectively as you can do and as thoroughly as you can do, combined with really good environmental control, and like I say, bleach works, great. Dampen down your dust, great um quarantine birds that, that come in and make sure they're healthy before you transfer them across those were the main control factors out of the american you know that very detailed multi-author uh, national recommendations if you like those were the main steps at controlling infection here not reaching for antibiotics routine all right lovely uh vishal from india i think he's after listening to you talk he's probably got the the answer already uh, but just to be polite he, he asks um is it possible to get the disease by touching the nest boxes um as in okay um, yes. yes the answer yes. is yes if you had it shed on feather dust in the nest box and you open the nest box and then you were messing about in the nest box and then you stopped and started to have a cup of tea and a biscuit you could ingest it or scratch your nose subsequently, yes, you could infect yourself. Lovely, thank you. Um, Tony Pringle and Damien Curl ask a, ask a question each, which, which is similar. Um, Tony asks uh, that you mentioned dampening down of the environment. Would you recommend mm -hmm. a fogger? And Damien said, can you use F10 to dampen down and clean afterwards, for instance? You know, using, yes. Using F10 to damp down. A lot of people use F10 for that reason, and we actually recommend the F10 a lot for the pet birds too, because we know the F10, of course, is effective against PBFD and, and, and polyoma. So these are obviously not a topic for tonight, but if you're going to do something, you may as well choose something that's going to hit multiple pathogens, haven't you? Um, so dampening that down, that does stop infectious feather dust twofold. One is it's dampening it so it's dropping to the floor anyway. But if you are doing a light mist with a disinfectant that's gonna have an actual kill effect on the surface as well, then that's an added bonus. So yeah, misting or fogging is going to help you with that. Now, as we said, there's still lots of organic debris. It's not gonna be an effective way of complete elimination. 
But if you want to knock infectious dust filled, infectious dust particles down to the ground so you don't inhale them and your birds don't inhale them, then brilliant, do that. And then you can clean out your cage. Then you can dis you know, then you can use your detergent to clean it all out spotless and then disinfect everything that you've got in there. So the use of a fogger or misting or spraying before cleaning out cages is probably something we should do. And let's turn this onto its head here and let's ignore infection now. Let's think about bird fancy as low. Okay, pigeon fancy as low. That's all mediated by feather dust. You inhaling feather dust particles into your lungs, setting up an allergic reaction. Now you will all know a bunch of fanciers that cough and splatter when they go into their birds. You will know fanciers who no longer keep birds because of the impact of that reaction. If you spray that, if you knock that dust down so you're not inhaling it, your clinical signs are much, much less. Put on a face mask, put on an N95 face mask if you like and do it. But what I'm saying is, is dampening that dust right down so you do not inhale it makes a ginormous difference to your health and your risk of having an allergic reaction to feather dust. So even the, even a, just a, a normal spray with with tepid water in it. I mean, spray yes. the pages. For yeah. The walls are if you went in just with a spray yeah. with tap water and just sprayed it to knock the dust down, so you didn't inhale it and you didn't yeah. spread the particles around because they were all sat on the bottom of the paper. Brilliant. Okay. Good one. Nice one. Um, someone asked, "Is it okay to add?" iodine into the water when you're dosing for whether it be psittacosis or megaback or anything else can add do it all separately do it all, se do it all separately you're, you're going to risk tainting things um i don't think you need to be giving iodine routine routinely every day as it were um and to some extent if you're treating you're going to be treating for a set block aren't you if that makes sense so no I, I would always treat one thing at a time and leave it at that you start mixing stuff together you may start interfering with things and interfere with palatability and um, do one product at a time that lovely um yeah we're, we're nearly there nearly there at the end um what's the difference between psittacosis and ornithosis did we talk about ornithosis? We did a little bit. Uh, I'm very bad, or maybe it's because I'm getting older, um, in that I will use about four or five different terms for psittacosis interchangeably uh, without even thinking about it. So psittacosis is infection with chlamydia in cytosines in your parrots. When you get infection with, with chlamydia in species that aren't parrots, it's called ornithosis because of ornithology, it's just birds. So ornithosis and psittacosis, if you like, are the lay terms between ornithosis is in a general bird, psittacosis is in a cytosine. Chlamydia is what we used to call chlamydia. Then it had a complete redesign and, and you know how these microbiologists love to change the name of a bug just because they get bored. And it was switched and then was chlamydophila for quite some time. But not all the microbiologists liked the word chlamydophila. They didn't really quite agree with it, and the research was a bit dodgy. And so in the last four or five years, they've all gone back to calling it chlamydia again. Um, so chlamydia is a current name for chlamydia, not chlamydophila, which is what it used to be called before they changed it to chlamydophila. Ornithosis is a bird, and psittacosis is a cytosine. It is all identically the same. The one thing we do need to be aware of, is, though, is that avian psittacosis, avian chlamydia, is different to human chlamydia. I once fell foul of a client, um, or many years ago, not, not, no, I didn't fall foul of the client, but, but you know, in the practice we were in, we, we, we were seeing, dealing with chlamydia every second of every day. It was a mixed practice. We had loads of birds coming in, loads of falcons, and it was just part of the day-to-day -day discussion. You were discussing chlamydia every day with people that came in. And this lady came in with a parrot that was sick. It was one of a grey parrot which had chlamydia. And we'd been treating it and the bird was getting better. And I was just in the waiting room. Oh, how's your bird getting on? Is chlamydia getting better? This sort of type of thing. And we ended up having a chat in the consult room. which said, well, maybe we shouldn't be discussing that in the waiting room. And I went, you don't get it like that. But I did make the point that what sometimes is normal to somebody like me to be discussing openly in public maybe isn't what other people would do. But this is a different thing. Um, you know, you're getting it through in inhalation primarily or ingestion. Um, 
but they are two different diseases, although your treatment is obviously pretty much identical. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've just got two more questions, and then we're going to have a, a fairly early night. The first one is, can I give doxycycline to rearing birds? That's a good point. Um, a very good point, again, because obviously if you want to blanket treat everybody, it's quite critically important you blanket treat everybody all at once. Doxycycline as a product does have side effects. Um, it affects um, teeth in particular in growing juveniles and things as well. So to some extent there, there is, um, the answer is no, you probably shouldn't. Um, on that basis, you should be waiting until your birds are all, or, or separate and can do it that way. Because again, if they're rearing young, you're probably giving soft food, aren't you? Or something, or groats, which have a higher moisture content. If they're going to try and drink more water, but they don't want to drink more water because it tastes funny, that's going to interfere with rearing anyway. So I think my best logic for you is I would be treating with doxycycline out with the breeding season to the birds once you've worked out what you want to keep and what you don't want to keep. Um, and to be fair, if you're having an outbreak of clinical disease whilst you're breeding, as we said, in many cases, you're going to have an increase of dead in shell or, or embryo mortality if you're getting vertical transmission. But you're going to get it going through the nest boxes like mad. So I think given this is a condition, if you had it as a clinical presentation, as a, a problem, I would be stopping breeding. I just reduce the stress lead on the birds because obviously this is the whole shedding thing. Treat them all as a collective group after breeding do the very best you can with what treatment we have available that's practical, and then we start subsequently. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the one, another question came in as well. Um, Julian Bradley asked, uh, Kevin, you, men you mentioned using bleach as a disinfectant. Can this be used on the flight floors cages as a cleaning agent? Yep. I, I use it routinely on everything for cleaning, yes. Okay, can I, well, while we're talking about that, can I, can I bring in Nicola? Are you, are you there, Nicola? What, what was the problem that we had where all our birds went mad? Was that, was that a bleach? Milton. Okay, so we used Milton on the floor and all the birds decided they were going to have a dance, didn't they? They just couldn't breathe. Yeah. So we do have to be aware of that. And I think what, what we're, we're saying here with any of these guys, if you're using this, um, and this goes back to any disinfection that you're going to use, is you've got to rinse it off and clear it and have well-ventilated well airspace after that. Um, you know, birds are incredibly sensitive to inhaled respiratory agents. That's why they go down mines, for example. So if you're going to use it, you basically need to have it in a well-ventilated area or your windows and doors open. And to be honest, once you've disinfected, you want to dry it. You want to clear that, that completely out. So for me, I guess that the vast majority of these cases where you would be looking at removing items from your shed for cleaning. That's why I like my wire cages, because I can take everything out of the shed, dunk it into a, a vat of bleach, and the birds are never exposed to, the, to you know, any potential fumes from the disinfection and that goes even down to things like Vercon S is horrible when you try and inhale that. The F10 is okay to be honest as a disinfectant routinely at about one in 1000 but even at more concentrated levels than that you can get um, quite advanced respiratory pathology in birds. We had um, we use it for nebulization in the parrots and we had one client once who despite having repeatedly been told what to do and having it on the label of the pot decided to use neat F10 for this uh, nebulizer for their bird and that bird died of acute respiratory distress and the lungs were just shot to pieces with it because uh, they didn't follow instructions. So birds are acutely sensitive to any inhaled thing. Disinfectants are not compatible with life generally um, so you wouldn't want to be injecting yourself with bleach or uh, shining a light inside your bottom or something for dealing with infections. Um, so you do have to be careful of that. So yeah if you're going to use it well ventilate the area afterwards ideally have the birds in another enclosure or another area or wheel if you've got a wire aviary wheel it outside disinfect it wheel it back in again take your cages out you know having things that are removable that can be cleaned and disinfected away from the birds 
avoids that being an issue and birds having a Milton dance. Right, okay, thank you. Just the two now. Matt Owens asks, um, is it okay if F10 gets on your bird? Yes, a one in thousand dilution, not a problem. Thank you. And lastly, um, it's not really to do with tonight, but it, I think it, there must be a good reason why he asked. He's asked that's Gerard Lanigan has asked, can you overfeed Drive and Gloss? Quite appropriate for the night, maybe, but it's our for last question for the night. I would need to have a little look at what's in Thrive and Gloss and come up with a conclusion for that, which I couldn't do off the top of my head. So Gerald Jim, can PM me and I'll tell him. Yeah, I'll Jim, I'll on the health thing, I'll ask him there and uh, no doubt I'll find out. Kevin, thank you so much. It's been very, very enlightening, I'll say. Um, so much to take in. I can't, I can't believe it was so... Um, it, it was so involved. And there's so much to know. Luckily, a lot of it, it, it I mean, the, I suppose the point of these classes, the classes, I, I say classes, yeah, yeah. I suppose I do teach students, but the, the point of these was, was to give you a, 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 as much detail and, and I guess to even just appreciate the, the not the gravity, but, but the, you know, the amount of stuff that goes behind this. It's not just a question of chucking something in the water and hoping. The references are on the healthcare page there. Um, any queries I'll answer. I've already uploaded the, the PowerPoints are on there already, and I know George, once he's finished his drink, will be um, <laughs> I'll see you, George. Um, will be um, you know putting this on on, on for, for the YouTube channel or whatever as well. So um, you know the point for these is this isn't a one-off meeting to go away and forget. This is this is a resource for you to utilize subsequently um, because of the amount of information that's here that you need to know and I guess what I'm trying to get people to do is to start being responsible, start being adults and start treating things properly instead of listening to stupid stories on a Facebook page from somebody who doesn't know. And if you want help, just ask. Easy enough. I'd rather you did things properly and effective and spent your money and time wisely than just burnt it on God knows whatever else you, that, that people recommend. That's why we have to thank you again, not not only for these monthly meetings, but you know, for running that health uh, page. I mean, that's that just an absolute wonderful resource and um, well worth a tenner a year. 19p a week. And you wouldn't, I, I've, got to tell, I've, got, I've got to tell all our members, because you've all paid a tenner to get in. Do you know the amount of people out there that won't pay a tenner? I promise you, I mean, we've got a, just a fraction under a hundred members at the moment. If it was free, we'd have 10,000. So that tells me there's 9,900 people out there too bloody tight to pay a tenner. How do you know it's 10,000? How many, how many people is that? That's well, a lot. I'm just guessing that 10,000 people would join. I'm looking at other, other groups and some groups, you know, after a while, they've got 10, 20,000 members. So a resource as good as what we've got here, we, we, we'd be just inundated with people wanting to be members. But there's 9,900 of them are too bloody tight to pay 19p a week. Anyway. Okay. I think, John, I think if I may interject at this point, I, I think, uh, and, and I'll, I'll stand by the, the reasons for, for, for doing this. This isn't about money. No. This is about value, if that <laughs> makes sense. And they're two different things. And I have lots of people that will tap me up for information left, right and centre and won't pay a single bit of attention to what I say because maybe it's not uh, what they want to hear. But if you value someone's opinion, then great. And I'm all for helping you as much as I can do. But if you don't value it, don't waste my time. I've got plenty of things that I do and plenty of people I help for people that value the opinion. So to some extent, that's the point of it is if you value it then value it come and join for a tenner that's what that's that's what that's the nod that you're giving and if you don't value it then you don't value the opinion so it's no point giving it yeah oh i, I totally agree with you just it uh, gets up my go anyway there you go can't right. save them all john no 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 anyway i'll have, I'll have me say so thank you very much everybody